Please be seated. I open this public session of the Council of Deans with this votum. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an exceptional honor to welcome you on behalf of the Council of Deans of the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam on the occasion of the inaugural lecture by Dr. John Beer as professor at the Metropolitan Callistos Ware Chair in Orthodox Theology in the Faculty of Theology at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. A warm welcome in particular to uh, you, Professor Beer, to your wife and uh, further uh, guests. A, a warm welcome also to His Eminence Archbishop uh, Moor Polycarpus of the Syrian Orthodox Church of Antioch, to His Eminence Bishop Arseny of the Coptic Orthodox Church, and to the very reverend Professor Andrew Louth. A special welcome to the Dutch and international Orthodox Christians who have come uh, especially for this occasion and of course a special welcome to all my colleagues as well. We greatly appreciate your presence ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for showing your interest in Professor Beer and his lecture and doing his honor to this faculty and university. Before introducing Professor Beer allow me to describe the new chair the Metropolitan Callistos Ware Chair in Orthodox Theology. The creation of a chair in Orthodox Theology is a novelty in the Netherlands, triggered among others by the need to train new clergy for the growing number of Orthodox parishes in the Netherlands, in the wake of the arrival of a growing number of migrants and refugees belonging to the Orthodox tradition. The creation of this chair in Orthodox theology is in line with the tradition of the Vrije Universiteit to study, teach and to reflect, to reflect critically on one's own religious theological tradition. With the creation of the chair, the Faculty of Theology strengthens structurally the teaching and research of the Orthodox theological tradition which was initiated by the appointment as visiting professor in 2010 of the recently retired, very reverend Professor Andrew Laut. This chair is named in honor of Metropolitan Callistos Ware, who taught at Oxford University for four decades, supervising countless doctoral students, many now in academic positions around the world who is the first Englishman since the Great Schism to have been made a bishop of the Orthodox Church. Indeed, several of his former research students are now eminent bishops and metropolitans throughout the world. And who has done more than anyone to bring the Orthodox Church and her theology to the West. Indeed, it would be no exaggeration to say that he is the most recognizable orthodox voice in the world. The Metropolitan cannot be here today due to frail health, but he has sent this message, and I quote, please assure Father John and the others present how deeply I am grateful for the significant honor which the Vrije Universiteit of Amsterdam has conferred upon me in naming a chair after myself. I wish Father John and future occupants of the chair every success in their lectures. With all my heart, I hope that this chair that is to bear my name will contribute positively in making the Orthodox Church better known in Amsterdam and far beyond." End of quote. The chair in Orthodox theology will be embedded within the Amsterdam Center for Orthodox theology and will cooperate with the director Michael Bakker and the fellow staff of the center. 
And I feel honored that I can use this opportunity, this inaugural lecture, to announce that the faculty board has appointed Johan Lena as lecturer in Orthodox theology, liturg in Orthodox liturgical theology, so that the staff of the strengthened is, is strengthened once more. So Professor, so Professor Beale will be the first person to hold the Metropolitan Callistos Wear Chair. Let me sketch Professor Beer's academic biography briefly. John Beer's academic education and career connects the academic disciplines of philosophy, patristics, and orthodox theology. And the context of the Western culture and a deep existential rooting in Eastern Christianity fed by an ongoing living contact with the sources of early Christianity, that is the New Testament and the patristic writings. John Beer studied philosophy in London and received an MPhil in patristics in Oxford. He defended his PhD in theology with the title um, Godly Lives, Asceticism and Anthropology, with special reference to sexuality in the writings of St. Irenaeus of Lyons and St. Clements of Alexandria. He defended this at Oxford University in 1995, a dissertation supervised by Rowan Williams and Andrew Louth. In 1997, he received his master's in theology at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary after finishing a master thesis with the title Translation of Irenaeus' Demonstration of the Apostolic, of the Apostolic Preaching with Introduction and Notes. Dr. Beer not only studied at St. Vladimir's in New York, he already started teaching there, first as visiting professor in 1993, and since 2004 as full professor. Um, and in the academic year 2004-2005, Dr. Beer taught as visiting professor at Harvard Divinity School, and since 2005, he is distinguished lecturer in patristics at Fordham University in New York. And above all that, since 2007, now for 10 years, Dr. Beer is the Dean of St. Vladimir's um, Seminary. As of the 1st of September 2016, the Executive Board of the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam appointed Professor Beer as the Metropolitan Callistos Wear Chair in Orthodox Theology. May I now request your kind attention to Professor Beer's inaugural lecture as professor at the Vrije Universiteit, a lecture entitled The Paschal Gospel, Reading John in Early and Eastern Christianity. Professor Beer, the floor is yours. Thank you. The Paschal Gospel, reading John in early and Eastern Christianity. Christian theology, as we know it today, is inconceivable without the Gospel of John, and especially the prologue. The word in the beginning with God and as God, the becoming flesh of the word, stated here in simple and beautiful prose. They are the key points that theology would grapple with in subsequent centuries. In controversies that resulted in imperially convoked worldwide councils, which define what we have come to think of as being the, the chief articles of the Christian faith, Trinity and incarnation. That the prologue speaks about the becoming flesh of the word is no doubt the reason why it's become the reading for the nativity of Christ, the feast of Christmas, for most of Western Christianity. In the tradition of Eastern Orthodoxy, however, the prologue is read on Easter night, at Pascha. And the reading of John continues throughout the Paschal season. It is the Paschal Gospel. 
Why is this so? What is the historical background for this? And does this indicate that perhaps we should be hearing the gospel in a different key? Within a century or so of its composition, the Gospel of John was described as being the spiritual gospel. And in the following centuries, the author was referred to simply as the theologian. And yet for most of the last century, it's been assumed that the Gospel of John is an outlier compared to the synoptics. With its striking emphasis on the divinity of Christ and his pre-existence, which led Kaiserman to decry it as little more than naive docetism. And the claim that it's first commented on by Gnostic writers such as Ptolemy and Heraclion, all this led to the belief that it originated in the Gnostic circles or other outlying circles, and that it was Irenaeus of Lyon who first appropriated the gospel for Catholic Christianity. This conviction was held almost universally by most 20th century scholarship. It has, however, been debunked over the last couple of decades. If the publication of Martin Hengel's book, The Johannine Question, delivered, as Charles Hill put it, a spanking to the Guild of Johannine Scholars, it was only received as a light lashing for they continued their work, Charles Hills said, almost unaffected. Hills' own exhaustive and meticulous study, the Johannine corpus in the early church, on the other hand, has surely administered the final flogging of the horses that by any academic standard should have been dead at the starting post. That is, the twin theories of what he calls orthodox Johannophobia, and Gnostic Johannophilia. The idea that the gospel, according to John, originated in and was first used by heterodox circles and was initially viewed with suspicion by the Orthodox Church, which remained silent about it until Irenaeus appropriated it for use by the great church, that whole theory has been debunked by Hill. And more than debunked, it's been turned on its head. As he puts it, there was no silence which needs to be accounted for. On the contrary, instead of a silence, one might better speak of a din, a relative tumult, an increasing uproar. If there was, he continues, Johannophobia, it was in point of fact, am fact amongst the Gnostics, whose relationship to the gospel was critical or adversarial before the Valentinians attempted to appropriate the gospel by a novel interpretation of the prologue. The gospel's offense to them was its emphasis on the incarnation of the word of God, its affirmation of the privileged status of eyewitnesses, the very points which are already central in the letters of John. So Charles Hills concludes, Irenaeus did not pull off the literary coup of the century, but continued the tradition witnessing to what had been known from the beginning. Now, when we turn again to what was known from the beginning, two facts emerge about the John who wrote the gospel, both of which have significance for how we understand the gospel. Once we turn from the attempt to discern the identity of the author of the gospel of John and his context by an internal analysis of the gospel, its composition, its redaction, its context, as most previous scholarship attempted to do by means of hypothetical theories of redaction and the supposed community that lay behind the gospel, once we turn from that to the historical witness to the gospel, which during the course of the second century is remarkably consistent, there are two key points that emerge. First, that the <coughs> that the John who wrote the gospel was not the apostle, the son of Zebedee, but an elder known as the disciple of the Lord. And second, that the practice of celebrating Pascha, Easter, derives from him, so much so that he's regarded and called the high priest. So the first point about John the elder, the disciple of the Lord. 
that there were, in fact, two people called John is indicated by the first external evidence we have from Papias of Hierapolis. Probably writing at the end of the first century, Papias began writing his works, preserving the information he'd gathered in the previous couple of decades. He began the, collecting the information in the last decades of the first century, the very time that the Gospel of John was being written, and then set about writing his records two or three decades later. The difficulty, of course, is that Papias' writings are now lost, and they're only known through quotations made by later authors, principally Eusebius. And Eusebius is very selective in his quotations from Papias. So according to Eusebius, Papias wrote this. He said, If anyone chanced to come by who had been in attendance on the elders, I inquired about the words of the elders. That is, what, according to the elders, Andrew or Peter said, or Philip or Thomas or James or John or Matthew or any other of the disciples of the Lord. And whatever Aristion and John the Elder, the disciples of the Lord, are saying. So he mentions two Johns. The John mentioned along with um, James clearly refers to the son of Zebedee, known to us from the Synoptic Gospels, but only mentioned once and then not by name in the Gospel of John in chapter 21. Moreover, at the time that Papias was collecting his material, all these figures are deceased. This is, he wants to find out what they had said. Now, Eusebius assumes that it was this John who wrote the Gospel. But then alongside this John, Papias mentions another John, together with Aristion, both of whom are known as the disciples of the Lord and are very much still alive. He wants to find out what they are saying. Eusebius continues that if one is reluctant, as he clearly is, to ascribe the apocalypse to John, the son of Zebedee, then Eusebius says it must have been the other John who wrote it, John the Elder. And he finishes off by saying that there were indeed two Johns in Ephesus because even today there are two tombs in the city bearing the name John. But that's where he stops. Rather than relating any more information that Papias might have had about the Gospel of John and its author, and perhaps more importantly, also regarding the Apocalypse, Eusebius then turns to berating Papias for having passed on all sorts of mythological nonsense and strange teachings regarding the eschaton, and he caps it off by saying, well, he was a man of very little intelligence. Now, if Papias did know of the Gospel of John, did he have anything more to say about it which, Papias is, which Eusebius is not prepared to report? And that is the heart of the controversy. Many have argued that not only did Papias know the Gospel of John, but that he attributed its authorship not to the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee, but to John the Elder, and claimed that he also wrote the Apocalypse. Now, we can, if that's the case, and there's good reasons for thinking it to be the case, we can readily understand why if Papias had indeed said that the Gospel of John was not written by the son of Zebedee, but by another figure called the Elder, who had also written the Apocalypse, Eusebius would have wanted to throw confusion by belittling Papias' intellectual activity, ability. Eusebius is particularly concerned to cast aspersions upon the Apocalypse. He quotes evidence from Dionysius of Alexandria in the third century, which claims that it was not written by the same person who wrote the gospel. Dionysius in the third century is the first person to question that. And that question is highlighted by Eusebius. Even though the common authorship of the gospel and the apocalypse was consistently affirmed throughout the course of the second century especially by those whom Lightfoot calls the school of John, in particular Irenaeus. Now, I'm going to come back to the question of the apocalypse later and the question of vocabulary and what it might in fact tell us. 
But let's stick with the question of, was there a John the Elder, distinct from the apostle John, the son of Zebedee, a John the Elder who wrote the gospel? Charles Hill has mounted a valiant defense against Eusebius's supposed obfuscation, arguing that the reason why Eusebius does not record what Papias says about the Gospel of John, although he does Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is because Eusebius had already done it a couple of chapters earlier. Hill's argument, Charles Hill's argument, was contested by Richard Baucom, and Charles Hill replied to Baucom, and the battle continues. It's not necessary for our purposes to enter into the details of that debate, but regarding the idea that Papias did indeed indicate that it was the elder and not the apostle who wrote the gospel, and that Eusebius did deliberately obfuscate the issue, Charles Hill says this, he says, the deception in this case cannot be confined to Eusebius. Other interested people clearly had read Papias' book, including Irenaeus and a number of other second and third century writers. Yet neither they nor anyone else ever reports the opinion that the gospel according to John had been written by John the Elder. But actually, this is just exactly what Irenaeus does say, though in slightly different words. Irenaeus has got his own distinctive and consistent vocabulary for referring to the author of the Gospel of John. There are 66 occasions when Irenaeus mentions John, the author of the Johannine material. 61 of these times, he does it by name, John who wrote the Gospel, the Apocalypse, and so on. Five other times, he doesn't mention the name, but is unambiguously referring to this John. Of these 66 occasions, 17 describe him as John, the disciple of the Lord. Four further times, he simply speaks of the disciple of the Lord, or his disciple, in contexts which make it clear that he's speaking about John. And one further time, he speaks about Christ as being the teacher of John. No other figure is called by Irenaeus simply the disciple, the disciple of the Lord. So the phrase, the disciple of the Lord, does not classify John, the author of the gospel, amongst other disciples. It's a distinctive title for him. It distinguishes him as the disciple of the Lord, just as Paul is also known as the apostle. Not simply one of the 12, nor one of the 13, but the apostle. In contrast to Irenaeus' repeated references to John, the disciple of the Lord, there are only five instances where he refers specifically to John, the son of Zebedee. And in each case, it is not connected in any way, shape, or form with the Johannine material, but rather to the figure who appears in the synoptics and acts. And then, moreover, in none of these occasions when he's talking about the John who appears in synoptics and acts, does he ever call him the disciple of the Lord. So Richard Baucom concludes on the evidence I've mentioned, other evidence, and we could spend the whole time talking about this, he says, for the members of the church of Ephesus and of the churches of the province of Asia generally, the disciple of the Lord was their own John, the one who reclined on the Lord's breast and wrote his gospel in Ephesus. Nothing that Irenaeus says either about John the disciple of the Lord or John the son of Zebedee remotely suggests that they might be the same person. They're very distinctively portrayed. John, the elder, the disciple of the Lord. Now, one other fascinating piece of information about the John who wrote the gospel comes to us from the letter of Polycrates of Ephesus, written in the latter decades of the second century in the midst of the paschal controversy that occurred in those last decades. Our primary source for this is again Eusebius, and once again, he presents us with a really heavily redacted account. According to Eusebius, 
the controversy between the Church of Rome, led by Victor, whom he imagines to be a fourth century pope, taking issue with the churches of Asia Minor for their celebration of Pascha on the 14th of Nisan, whatever day of the week it might be, they're the so-called quarter decimans or the 14, the 14ers, those who celebrate Pascha on the 14th of Nisan. So Eusebius imagines it being a controversy between a Pope of Rome and the Christians in Asia Minor. But all the evidence he gives us, as is pretty much universally agreed now, indicates that it's a controversy within Rome. It's an intra-Roman controversy in which the communities of Christians from Asia Minor celebrated Pascha on the 14th of Nisan, whereas the Roman Christians had no annual celebration of Pascha, but only kept the Lord's Day. The eventual resolution to this was to celebrate Pascha on the Sunday following the 14th of Nisan, and at that point, Sunday became known really the day of the resurrection in a way which it wasn't quite so before. Irenaeus intervenes in this controversy with a beautiful line where he says, the disagreement in our practice confirms our unity in faith. It's a beautiful line. That's a disagreement between people who celebrate an annual Paschal feast and others who've got no annual commemoration. Now, in the midst of reporting this controversy, Eusebius preserves a letter from Polycrates of Ephesus, another quarter decimal. In this letter, Polycrates asserts that the Paschal Feast was celebrated in this way by all of his kinsmen, and he names seven of them who were all bishops, and he concludes, these all observed the 14th day for Pascha according to the gospel, in no way deviating from it, but following the rule of faith. Moreover, this practice, he says, goes back to the beginning, to John, John who lay on the Lord's breast and who resides, at, who rests at Ephesus, and he says, who was a priest wearing the petalon, both a witness and a teacher. So, a letter written in 170, 180 in Ephesus by the Bishop of Ephesus, referring back to John who resides, who rests in Ephesus, saying he was a priest wearing the petalon. Now, to say that John the author of the gospel is a priest wearing the petalon, is, to put it mildly, perplexing. According to Josephus, in the fullest description we have of the headdress worn by the high priest in the Jerusalem temple, this headdress, this petalon, was elaborate and ornate. It was designed to inspire awe. In addition to the linen headdress worn by the other priests, the high priest wore another one on top, embroidered in blue and encircled by a golden crown in three rows, out of which rose um, a golden plate uh, upon which was written the very name of God in sacred characters, the Tetragrammaton. So this is a really distinctive mark worn by the high priest in the context of the temple. The letter of Aristeus also has a description of it, and says, it was a great occasion of amazement to us when we saw Eleazar engaged upon his ministry in all his glorious vestments. And he carries on for several lines, culminating in the description of the petalon. And he carries on then, he says, their appearance makes one awestruck and dumbfounded. A man would think that he had come out of this world and into another one. He's come out of this world and into another one, seeing the petalon. So when Polycrates says that John was a high priest wearing the petalon, as Richard Baucom puts it, his words state as precisely and unambiguously as possible that John was the high priest in the Jerusalem temple. Now, that's perplexing to say the least. So there have been all sorts of ways of interpreting this claim. Some have taken it loosely or metaphorically as no more than an interest in Christ's high priesthood that we have in Hebrews and the Apocalypse, the description of Christians as being a royal priesthood and so on. But that doesn't do justice to Polycrates' very specific assertion that he is the high priest wearing the petalon. 
Richard Baucombe, having looked through the various arguments, he suggested that Polycrates' words should be understood neither metaphorically nor historically, which he thinks really to be implausible, but he says exegetically. And what he's got in mind by saying we should take it exegetically is this. He says that just as Polycrates has conflated the Philip of the Twelve with Philip the Evangelist, who is mentioned in Acts, so too Polycrates has identified the John who wrote the Gospel with the John mentioned in Acts 4.6, who is said to come from a priestly family. Yet this still doesn't explain why Polycrates would go the extra step he doesn't simply say that John was of a high priestly family, which is in fact all that you could derive from Acts 4, 6. He says, John wore the petalon. And as he, Richard Baucom, acknowledges, this is an unambiguous assertion that John was the high priest. While Richard Baucom calls his interpretation exegetical, it's clear that he's still working in a historical key. He's looking for historical information about the author of the gospel. There's another approach one can take, which is equally exegetical, but takes its lead from the gospel of John itself, rather than Acts 4.6, and its mention of John the, uh, of the priestly family. So an ex another exegetical interpretation, and one which could be considered properly theological. The Gospel of John, after all, begins its narrative with the Baptist identifying Jesus as the Lamb of God. The high point of the narrative, if not its conclusion, it is finished, Christ says on the cross. The high point, if not the conclusion, is the crucifixion of Jesus at the moment when the lambs are slain, or rather when the Lamb is slain. Christ had already invited the Jews to destroy the temple and in three days I will raise it up. And as the evangelist commented, he spoke of the temple of his body. It is finally, of course, only in the Gospel of John that one of the disciples remains at the foot of the cross along with the mother. And that is the disciple whom Jesus loved who as the uniquely privileged eyewitness is not only able to bear witness, but he says, a true witness. The witness we give is true. So with that background, it's easy to understand how for Polycrates, John is the high priest ministering at the Paschal mystery. The temple in question is not the stone edifice in Jerusalem, but Christ himself, the temple. Just as the Lamb of God slain in the mystery is also now Christ himself. So many different images are brought together by John, who in this way is now the high priest of the Christian mystery, the one wearing the petalon, the high priest with whom originated the practice of celebrating Pascha. So the two pieces of information that the second century gives us about the author of the Gospel of John, the high priest with whom originated the practice of celebrating Pascha. We also saw how the letter of Aristeus spoke of the awe that the petalon would inspire. He said, a man would think that he's come out of this world into another one. And that is indeed the effect that is produced in a reader when turning from the synoptics to the Gospel of John. Everything is not as it seems. Everything seems turned upside down. A new world opens up before us. And so it's in this sense that John Ashton, in his landmark book, Understanding the Fourth, Fourth Gospel, suggested that the Gospel of John should be understood as an apocalypse in reverse, upside down, inside out. Apocalyptic thinking has perhaps never been so fashionable as it is today. To understand why, we have to return to a couple of articles written by Ernest Kaiserman some 50 years ago, in which he said that apocalyptic was the mother of all Christian theology. 
But by apocalyptic, he specifically meant the enthusiasm engendered by the possession of the spirit as a pledge of an imminent parousia. It's always an imminent parousia, the soonness of Christ's coming, that Kaiserman meant by apocalyptic. He suggests that we should seriously take the post-Easter apocalyptic as being a new theological start, the first chapter, the beginning of dogmatics itself, not the concluding one as has become the traditional dogmatic approach. He says, Kaiserman says, the heart of primitive Christian apocalyptic, according to Revelation and the synoptics alike, is the accession to the throne of heaven by God and by his Christ as the eschatological son of man. And then he asks, has there ever been a theological system that has not collapsed? Have we been promised that we should know ourselves to be in a possession of a theologia perennis, a perennial, perennially valid theology? Clearly not, is the answer his rhetorical question demands. Rather, he says, it is only certain theological themes in the proclamation that are carried on from one generation to the next and thus preserve the continuity of the history of theology. And chief among these themes is the hope of the manifestation of the Son of God on his way to enthronement. And we have to ask ourselves whether Christian theology can ever survive in any legitimate form without this theme. We sprang from the Easter experience and determined the Easter faith. Now, Kaiserman's thesis is provocative and generated much discussion in the following decades, but it's also fairly limited, primarily because he develops his reflections almost exclusively out of the Synoptic Gospels and the Book of Revelation. He's already determined what is to count as apocalyptic, the expectation of an imminent parousia. But his central claim that apocalyptic is the mother of all Christian theology and that we are not given a system as a theologia perennis, but only the hope of the manifestation of the Son of God on his way to enthronement are ones I want to return to at the end. Now, the decades since Kaisman wrote have seen a burgeoning of scholarship on Second Temple Judaism and intertestamental literature. Seeing in the period prior to the establishment of rabbinic Judaism, many rich and varied theme, themes. However, while new vistas have opened up in modern scholarship, the term apocalyptic has become rather contentious. As N.T. Tom Wright notes in his survey of Pauline scholarship over the past century, he says, the term apocalyptic is slippery and polymorphous. It's become a watchword for a whole new family of interpretations, primarily those of Paul, but also something of a catchphrase denoting a particular style of theology. He's got his eye set on J. Louis Martin and apocalyptic theology as Martin understands it. Now, Wright is right, Wright is right on many points, but there are also issues in Tom Wright's account that I'd want to address, but that's for another time. For now, I'd concur with him that the term has become slow, so slippery, capable of so many twists and turns of meaning, that it would be safest to confine the term apocalyptic simply to a literary genre, that of revelation, which is, after all, he says, what the word basically means. If we do not use the word in a manner that's actually grounded in a particular religio-historical context about which we're speaking, we will certainly lose our moorings in reality, theological as well as historical. So over the last couple of decades, there's been a great deal of reflection about the nature of the genre of apocalypse. The Society of Biblical Literature in America concluded their work by defining the genre of apocalypse this way. It says, apocalypse is a genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient, disclosing, what tra disclosing a transcendent reality which is both temporal, insofar as it envisions eschatological salvation, and spatial, insofar as it involves another supernatural world. Now, if that's going to be the definition of the genre apocalypse, 
and it's been largely accepted by the scholarly guild, with a few tweaks here and there. As John Ashton puts it, he says, it fits the fourth gospel to a T. So the gospel of John is a narrative in which an otherworldly figure descends from heaven and mediates knowledge about heavenly things, especially regarding God and his son, reveals all of this to a particular human being and to others. The Son of Man bridges heaven and earth, <clears throat> thus opening up the heavens to human beings. This revelation mediates personal eschatological salvation if it finds a response of faith, and indeed offers a birth from above and the Spirit, enabling recipients to become children of God. John blends together an emphasis on the present reality of judgment and salvation with a recognition that the consummation of all this still lies in the future. The Gospel of John, in addition, places the events unfolding in its narrative always within a heavenly perspective, an understanding of which is only available to the disciples after his glorification, when another heavenly figure is sent to remind them of all that the first one said and done. So it's got all of these apocalyptic themes in it. Yet despite all of these commonalities, structural and thematic commonalities, it remains the case that the Gospel of John, as Ashton acknowledges, is, well, obviously not an apocalypse. And so he suggests that it's an apocalypse in reverse, upside down, inside out. For this reason, he says, there is no divine plan first disclosed to a seer in a vision and then repeated in earthly terms. The divine plan itself, the Logos, is incarnate, fully embodied in the person of Jesus. It's his life that reveals God's grand design of saving the world, a design now being realized and lived out by the community. So, inside out, upside down, back and front. But that's not quite sufficient. For there are apocalypses, such as 4th Ezra and 2nd Baruch, in which there are no heavenly visions or ascents, but which are fully played out on earth. There are other reasons why the Gospel of John cannot be considered an apocalypse. The mediating figure in the Gospel of John is not an angel, but Jesus himself, the Word of God, who is one with God, who's crucified, buried, and raised to life, something which never happens with the mediators in Jewish apocalypses. And so Reynolds concludes, the Gospel of John bursts the wineskins of the genre apocalypse. Benjamin Reynolds goes on to suggest that the best designation for the Gospel of John is an apocalyptic gospel. Not an apocalypse upside down, but an apocalyptic gospel. The word apocalyptic here is not an appeal to a theological or an ideological presupposition or tendency, like it is with J. Louis Martin, but is rather used to indicate the alignment of the gospel with the literary genre and content of apocalypses. It's an adjective qualifying a noun. The noun is the gospel, which the Gospel of John unambiguously is. So although the Gospel of John is clearly different from those of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they do all, of course, narrate the life and deeds of Jesus and proclaim the good news about him. Whatever we might determine about the nature of the genre of gospel and its origin, it's clear that they do resemble Greco-Roman biographies, but include and indeed emphasize a proclamation of the good news, something that is generally absent from a biography. In the case of John, it's not simply a kerygmatic biography, as, Richard Heng as Hengel would, Martin Hengel would call them, Rather, it's an apocalyptic gospel. It's a gospel in that it's a narrative that proclaims a salvation offered through Christ, but it is apocalyptic in that it utilizes structural and thematic elements shared with materials found in the genre of the gospel, of the apocalypse. So bringing all of this together in a novel manner, it breaks both molds. As Benjamin Reynolds concludes, John's gospel is not so much an apocalypse reversed inside out, upside down, but an apocalypse that is shaken, stirred, and inserted into the gospel. Now, describing the gospel of John as an apocalyptic gospel, 
begs for further reflection upon the relationship between the Gospel of John and the Apocalypse in his name. Despite the almost universal skepticism in modern times about the common authorship of the Gospel and the Apocalypse, as I mentioned earlier, these two works were almost universally held to be by the same author during the course of the first two centuries, especially by those who claimed direct lineage with only one intervening generation to John himself. Irenaeus, Polycarp, back to John. Now, in considering the questions of identifying and using the genre apocalypse, two further points need to be made, which I've not seen made so far in modern discussion. The first is that the use of the term apocalypse for designating a particular genre is in fact made on the basis of this work, the Apocalypse of John. Specifically, its opening words, the first word of which is apocalypse, and was very soon used as a title for the work itself. So it calls itself an apocalypse. And in this, it is distinct from all earlier and contemporary works, usually classified alongside it. First Enoch, fourth Ezra, second Baruch, and so on. Although the term apocalypse does occur in the opening words and is used as a title for later works, such as the apocalypse of Abraham, the apocalypse of Adam, and all the others. The second point is that the apocalypse of John is absolutely unique in that it alone is written in the name of a contemporary and living author, rather than a figure from Israel's distant past. Enoch, Ezra, Baruch, Abraham, Adam, and so on. No, it's John. These two points should remind us that while useful and in fact necessary for serious discussion, definitions of literary genre are our own constructs. The Apocalypse of John, the title of which is now used to designate a genre, the Apocalypse of John does not fit into the pseudepig pseudepigraphical character of all other works in that genre. Even if in writing the Apocalypse, John was inspired, as Ashton argues, by first Enoch, he was not consciously writing a work within the genre Apocalypse as the authors of later apocalypses might have done so. So employing a word which was distinctly and uniquely used by the, a particular author for his text in his name to designate a genre including other works not so called and then using the, the at least partial affinity of the Gospel of John to this genre illuminating as it might be for understanding the Gospel of John, risks obscuring the relationship between the Gospel and the Apocalypse, claiming to be written by the same author. You're going around in a circle, and you're missing the point. Now, skepticism about the common authorship of the Gospel and the Apocalypse is usually based on the first point made by Dionysius of Alexandria, that the works differ in vocabulary and style, they cannot be by the th same author. There's been debate about that ever since. But that's the first of two points. The second point he makes is that he notes that some have rejected the apocalypse, and I'm quoting him, declaring it to be unintelligible and illogical, and its title false. For they say that it's not John's, nor yet an apocalypse, since it is veiled by great and thick curtain of an unintelligibility. It's not an apocalypse because it's veiled by this great and thick curtain of unintelligibility. Now Dionysius is playing here on the most basic meaning of the term apocalypse, one which must ultimately take priority over any definition of genre. And that is, the word apocalypse means unveiling. Yet, if it is an unveiling, as is declared by the opening word, why then does everything seem so obscure, as if veiled by an impenetrable curtain? 
If we take it at its word, however, could it be that an, uh, could it be that the apocalypse is in fact an unveiling? It is the unveiling which is paralleled by the Gospel of John, the apocalyptic gospel, where the adjective apocalyptic designates the gospel's use of the various trappings of works included in our genre apocalypse. Could it be the fact that the Gospel of John is in fact the work which veils what is unveiled in the Apocalypse? That the Apocalypse is in fact the unveiling, the clear statement, and it's veiled in John the Apocalyptic Gospel. Veiling the ultimate victory of God in Christ in terms of a narrative about Jesus and his apparent defeat even if that veiling is done with an apocalyptic cast. Now, speaking about the narrative quality of the gospel as a veil over the gospel is, in a sense, no different than pointing out that the gospel proclaimed by Paul is, historically speaking, only subsequently given narrative form in the gospel. You go from the proclamation of the gospel to a narrativization of it. So the hermeneutic movement from apocalypse to gospel would also be given historical grounding if we were to accept, as Lightfoot and Rowland have argued, that the apocalypse was written not in the late first century, but around 68 AD. Moreover, when Paul proclaims the gospel, he does so in terms of an apocalypse, the unveiling of an eternal mystery most clearly in the end of his letter to the Romans, where he says, Now to him who's able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the apocalypse of the mystery which was kept secret for long ages, but is now made manifest and made known through the prophetic writings, according to the command of the eternal God to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God be glory forevermore. So the gospel in the singular, the preaching of Jesus Christ, is the apocalypse of the mystery that is made known through the prophetic writings. With this proclamation of the gospel, the apocalypse of the mystery, the scriptures, what we now call the Old Testament, is unveiled. And it's in terms of the scriptures that Paul presents Christ and that the evangelists thereafter depict Christ in the Gospels. Irenaeus describes the scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, as being a thesaurus, a treasury of precious stones, which his which opponents have misused, but really form a mosaic depicting Christ the King. His opponents have rearranged the stones and produced an image of a fox. More recent times, someone like Joel Marcus has used a similar analogy. He compares the evangelist, the scriptures to a paint box, which are used by the evangelist to depict Christ. Richard Hayes, another, another significant writer, he concludes that for Paul, scripture has become a metaphor, a vast trope that signifies and illumines the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God has acted in Christ in a definitive and unexpected manner, making everything new, scripture must be read anew. The word of the cross, the preaching of Christ crucified, may be a scandal for the Jews and folly for the Gentiles, but it alone is a power of God making known the wisdom of God. So the preaching, the kirigma, provides what Hayes calls the eschatological apocalypsis of the cross a hermeneutical lens through which scripture can be refracted with profound new symbolic coherence. So in the Gospels, then, the evangelists proclaim Christ by drawing upon the language of the scriptures, investing him, clothing him with these words as the flesh by which he's made known, by which he's seen, by which he's understood. But these narratives, therefore, are also a veil, which, while essential for communicating the gospel, must be unveiled for the gospel to be received as a proclamation, 
rather than merely a report about past events. And finally, it's exactly with this hermeneutical move that we pass from the synoptic gospels to that of John. In the synoptics, the disciples are presented as not understanding Christ on the basis of scripture until after the passion, road to Emmaus in Luke 24. In the gospel of John, however, the narrative begins with this various point. At the very beginning of the gospel, the Baptist identifies Christ as being the Lamb of God. Philip tells Nathanael, we found the one of whom Moses spoke in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. The very beginning of the gospel of John, unlike the synoptic gospels, it is by reference to the scripture that Philip identifies Jesus. Yet he still identifies him as being the son of Joseph. He's not yet fully understood Christ's true identity. After a brief conversation with Jesus, Nathanael then addresses him, alluding to the title of the crucified one. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Yet even that's not enough. Christ replies saying, you will see greater things than these. Truly, truly, I say to you, you'll see the heavens opened, the apocalypse, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So John's depiction of Christ is very different than the earlier Gospels. There's no event of transfiguration, because on every page we see the transfigured Lord, the one who's from above, the one who's not put to death, but rather lays down his life of his own accord at the right time. The one who does not pray that the cup should pass from him, yet reconciles himself in anguish to the Father's will, but rather says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, for this purpose I've come to this hour. While we hear in the other Gospels that at the crucifixion the curtain of the temple was rent in two, this is not mentioned in the Gospel of John, for even at this point, even if the gospel is, uh, the narrative of the gospel is still veiled, at this point we hear the crucified one not crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But rather affirming with stately majesty, it's finished. Or rather, it is completed. It is perfected. And then handing over the spirit to the mother, to the disciple who stands unashamed at the foot of the cross, who in turn puts on Christ's own identity with Christ saying, woman, behold your son. So what it is that is finished or completed at this point are all apocalyptic themes. Judgment. Now is the judgment of the world. The temple. He spoke of the temple of his body. The son of man, the true living human being. Behold the human being. The project of God begun at the beginning, completed at the end. So we can now finally return to the rhetorical questions posed by Kaiserman, to the effect that we should not think of ourselves as in possession of a theologia perennis. Not even the supposed central pillars of Christian theology, Trinity and Incarnation, supposedly, but rather understand the continuity of theology consists in the preservation of certain themes in the proclamation, especially the hope of the manifestation of the Son of God on his way to enthronement, and that this theme sprang from the Easter experience and determines the Easter faith. This is what ensures the survival and the continuity of Christian theology, and in fact is, as to borrow Keisman's phrase, the mother of all Christian theology. As such, Given that the celebration of Pascha originated exclusively in, almost exclusively in Johannine circles, looking back to John as a high priest of the Paschal sacrifice, the most appropriate description of this gospel is not an apocalyptic gospel, although it is that in a qualified sense that I've sketched out, but it is rather the Paschal gospel. Concludes my my, le my inaugural lecture. The Vrij Universiteit of Amsterdam has had a really proud history 
and is internationally recognized for having a faculty of theology which hosts one of the almost all the major world religions and promotes a constructive dialogue between them. So I'm greatly honored by accepting the, the newly established Metropolitan Callistos Ware Chair of Orthodox Theology at the appointment of the Fact of Theology. And express my deepest gratitude to the Rector Magnificus, Vinod Subramanian, and to the Executive Board of the Vra Universitat, to the Dean Ruart Hansford, who is not able to be here today, and to the Vice Dean Eddie van der Borg for your um, for your oversight of the ceremonies today, and especially to the former Dean, Vim Janze, for all your tireless work, all your support, and for all you've done to bring this about. To Father Michael Backer and the board of ACOT, the Amsterdam Center for Orthodox Theology, and for all that you and they have done in making ACOT a reality in the most concrete way today. To His Eminence, um, Archbishop Polycarpus, and to His Grace, Bishop Arseni, for being here today, and Your Eminence for speaking this morning. To my doctoral examiner and long-term mentor in the ways of fathers, the very Reverend Professor Andrew Louth, thank you for being here. To all my colleagues from around the world who are able to be here today, especially Professor Hans Bursma, and for your work, kind words this morning and challenging questions this morning, and to Professor Joost van Rossum of St. Sergius Institute in Paris, thank you for coming as well. Of course, my doctoral supervisor, Metropolitan Callistos, whose chair this is named in his honor, who unfortunately is not able to be with us today. And of course, last but not least, my wife, Dr. Kate Bear, for all her unfailing support, encouragement, and uh, tolerance for all the time, support in all the times that I am absent and on the road, traveling and otherwise occupied. Thank you. highly esteemed colleague, dear John. Thank you for your inaugural lecture. I would call it not Paschal, but apocalyptic in a special sense. It's revealing something of um, unveiling something of the theologian John, not the evangelist but the theologian John Beer. Thank you so much. Thank you for accepting the Metropolitan Calestos Wedge here in Orthodox theology. We are honored because you embody what we as individual scholars and as a community at this specific faculty try to be or to become. We are aware and we recognize your prolific academic writing. Until now, as, we have, as I've counted well, I'm not sure, 12 academic volumes and almost 60 refereed articles in a diversity of disciplines, subdisciplines. But it's not only about the quantity, but even more about the quality of your work. You have shown your critical and methodological abilities in your critical editions and translations of the work of Irenaeus, Diodor of Tarsus, and Theodore of Mopsestia. And building on this in the interface of patristic study and historical theology, you are able to produce cutting edge volum volumes of the highest quality, such for example, for example your work on uh, origins, the Principius. But you are even able to go beyond this ability to be one who is able to understand and engage emphatically with the thought world of the antiquity. And through this, 
you are able to reveal apocalypse, the continuing relevance of the patristic thought in an existential actualization. Through this, you have become able to write substantial and original pieces of theological reflection, like your theological meditation on Christological foundation of Christian existence, mystery of Christ, life in death. It shows how your scholarly originality has been matched by intellectual creativity and spiritual depth. But this deep understanding of the patristic thought has now brought you to a new reading of the New Testament itself, as witnessed in this inaugural lecture, and soon accessible in your forthcoming John the Theologian and his Paschal Gospel, a prologue to theology. What we witness here is the production of a public theology of the highest order, bringing new and deeper understanding of the Christian source texts in dialogue with contemporary hermeneutical and phenomenological perspectives, as like in the work of Jean-Luc Marion and Michel Henry. Um, John the Theologian, writing the prologue to theology. We look forward to the next volumes in your, we hope, developing systematic theology. Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury and now at Magdalene College, Cambridge, recommended you with the following words. In his generation, he, that's you, John, stands out as perhaps the finest scholarly mind in English-speaking orthodoxy. I believe him to be absolutely ideally suited to this important position and to represent all the qualities your specification lists. I recommend him with the greatest enthusiasm. Professor Khaled Anatolios from Notre Dame added to this, to my mind, Father Beer exemplifies the best features of the orthodox theological tradition, faithfully rooted in the wisdom of the past but generously engaged with the present and creatively open to the future. I recommend him wholeheartedly and enthusiastically and without any hesitations. Um, Dr. Beer, I also like to mention that you have produced some very uh, important survey volumes on the development of patristic theology that have become the standards textbooks in the field. And this brings me to the field of teaching. I only had the opportunity once to be part of your teaching. It's an experience. You teach with energy, with passion and excitement. Dear Dr. Beer, we welcome you as teacher at the Amsterdam Center for Orthodox Theology. We congratulate its trustees and its director, Michael Bakker, with your appointment and this event. We also welcome you at colleague at this faculty. This is a faculty of ecumenical encounter of Christian and non-Christian religious and non-religious traditions. Your colleague John McGuggin, Nielsen Professor of Church History at Columbia University in New York wrote in his reference letter about you that you represent, and I quote, a style of orthodoxy which is at once historically and doctrinally faithful, yet open-hearted, expensive, and inclusive in the best way. That is exactly the spirit with which we try to engage at this faculty with each other, coming from our diverse, uh, diversity of traditions. Dr. Beer, we look forward to collaborating with you, especially with the Department Text and Traditions, uh, the research group Early Christianity under the leadership of Bertjan Leetard Peer Bolte and the Dutch Centrum for Patristisch Onderzoek. We look forward to collaborating with you when you will be supervising doct uh, doctoral research. Dear colleague, dear John, we congratulate you on behalf of the faculty board with this festive moment in your life and career, congratulating also your wife at this moment. I want to give the last word again 
to Metropolitan Callistos Ware. That's what he wrote. I can think of no better uh, candidate, better qualified, to be appointed to this position than Dr. Beer. Ever since the time that I acted at his, as his university supervisor, when he was working at Oxford for his doctorate, I have had a very high opinion of his scholarly ability and of the skill with which, as a teacher, he can communicate his ideas. He is extremely hardworking, generally original in his ideas, and remarkably gifted as a writer, as is indicated by a substantial list of publications. I'm fully confident that his presence as a member of your faculty will greatly enhance the work of the Vrije Universiteit. Dear colleague, very welcome. This ceremony is now completed. Professor Beer, um, accompanied by his wife, will now lead the procession out of this hall and I invite you to follow after having given way to all those sitting in the front rows. I would like to close this public session of the Council of Deans by pronouncing the doxology. Please stand. The name of the Lord be praised now and forever. <laughs> 